Anthony Evans was visiting New York City in 2003 when there was one of their unfortunate blackouts. Subway's closed, the UN is closed, Wall Street's closed, everything's in a blackout. And as he's trying to make his way through the streets, he sees one restaurant, lights on, people having meals, nothing seems to have changed inside. So he goes into the restaurant and he asks one of the waiters, what's going on here? The city's in a blackout. And the waiter said, well, when we built this restaurant, we built it with a gas generator. So no matter what's going on outside, we've got power on the inside. Tonight, we are gathering with our candidates who are looking for inside power, the power of the Holy Spirit that you and I have received first in baptism and then renewed in a new way in confirmation. When John the Baptist was baptizing, his was a baptism of repentance. It was not the sacramental indwelling of the Spirit that would come later through Christian baptism and confirmation. But as they were preparing, many of them thought that he was the Messiah. And he clearly indicated he wasn't even worthy to untie the sandal strap of the true Messiah who was yet to come. But to prepare for his coming, they needed to get rid of a lot of things in their lives. It reminds me when Paul says in the reading to the Philippians, rejoice, and I say it again, rejoice, for the Lord is near. We look at many Christians and wonder we see no joy. Joy is the infallible sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Joy of soul. It's not ha-ha happiness. I'm talking about joy, deep down joy, the divine fire of the Spirit in the soul. So why do we see so many sourpuss saints, if you will? Perhaps because we're like those limbs in your backyard. I was in my backyard today trying to make a little path with that heavy wet snow and looking at the limbs on the evergreens all hanging down so heavy. I knocked off some of that heavy snow and the limbs came alive, popped up. I was thinking about joy in the spirit. Maybe we're overburdened, we're overwhelmed. We've got all things going on, so many things going on that we can't keep our hearts fixed on the real reason for this season. Maybe you've got too many engagements to, to make. Maybe you've got too many shopping items you've got to pick up. Maybe you've got too much work going on. Maybe you've got this, you've got that. And then there are family arguments. Then there are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the limbs are down. We're heavy burdened. We need to be freed and lightened. St. John the Baptist tells them as they ask, well, so what are we supposed to do? How do we get ready for this coming? The first group, individual group he speaks to are the tax collectors. Now, these are the people most hated in Israel because they worked for the Romans and they cheated the Israelites for more than what was due, and they kept it for themselves. And so what does he say to them? Quit your job? That's not what he said to them. He says, be just. Don't require more than is due. That's what justice is. Justice is rendering unto another what is due. Not more, not less. Imagine that. Justice is a way to prepare for the coming of Christ. Absolutely. What about the group of soldiers? Well, don't use your power to threaten people into giving you money are using false testimony because you've got the sword and they're afraid. Lying, in other words. How much lying do we have in our culture that destroys people's souls? Not only the people that you lie about, but it destroys the liar. And there's so much deception going on that people almost believe their lies. They live in self-deception. He doesn't say, quit your job. He calls them to honesty to decency, to virtue, virtue, a habitual experience of doing the right thing in every occasion. And what does he say to the general crowd? 
He says, well, if you have two coats, share with the person who has none. If you have food, share with the person that's hungry. What is he teaching us? Not only justice, but charity. We call that the works of mercy. Pope Francis, this very week, opened the doors of St. Peter's Basilica to a holy year of mercy. And of the corporal works of mercy, there are seven. The first being feeding the hungry. Second, giving drink to the thirsty. Third, clothing the naked. Fourth, sheltering the homeless. Fifth, visiting the sick. Sixth, visiting the imprisoned. And finally, burying the dead. Sometimes we have to use ingenuity in doing the works of mercy when we're facing opposition. I think of this Israeli soldier that I read about. We see so much horror in the Middle East. And here was a soldier who found himself patrolling in occupied territory. And from his back, stones are being thrown. So he turns around with his gun, prepares to fire, and he finds three young boys who had thrown the stones. He did not want to shoot them. So he put his gun down, and he went to the stones, picked them up, and used a talent that he had. He began to juggle the stones in the air. And the boys who had thrown them went from faces of anger and hatred to relief and eventually applause. They applauded the Israeli soldier who was also a juggler. Then he put the stones down and walked away. He showed mercy in a very, very difficult situation. We have to find ways to show mercy in a difficult world, in our own day and time. Yes, many of you have contributed to our own Thanksgiving effort to feed the hungry and to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked through various organizations like St. Vincent de Paul's thrift store, to shelter the homeless, assisting, for example, the Brothers of the Good Shepherd who take in the homeless and feed them, or visiting the sick or the imprisoned, like our own parish group that goes to the juvenile detention center and brings the scripture and Christ to those young people that often feel abandoned, or the sick who are often in nursing homes with no one to visit. But you do it. And burying the dead, that was taken for granted for so long, but not anymore. There are children who do not bury their parents. When the parents die, they do not have a mass said for the repose of the soul. And I remember last year, right after Christmas, one of the groundskeepers said, Father, there's a box under one of the trees. I went to find this box. He says, it looks like a treasure chest. You know what it was? It's cremated remains. You see, a home had been burglarized at Christmas, and they thought that that chest was some kind of jewels or treasures. And most of the time when thieves break into home and take urns or boxes and they discover it's not what they thought, they throw it in the dumpster. They throw your mother or your father in the dumpster. It took quite a great deal of work through the police department and funeral homes to try and determine who this person was and who the family was. And finally, including the Albuquerque Journal obituaries, we were able to identify and make a connection. I found the son, I called him in, and I said, please let me bury your father. You could well have lost his remains forever. Think about it, it's a work of mercy, friends. It's a work of mercy, and that's not the first time I've heard of this happening. Bury the dead. Now, when we look at our celebration of Advent, I would suggest we need an extreme makeover. You remember that series that used to be on television, The Extreme Makeover? I think we need an extreme world makeover, and it begins with each one of us, individually and personally, by taking up acts of justice and acts of mercy. 
Look into your soul. See what you are doing that is unjust and bring it to the Lord. We have the great sacrament of reconciliation for the parish this week, tomorrow, and offer it each week. Bring that to the Lord and then find ways to act differently like that soldier turned juggler taking an extremely difficult situation and transforming it into a moment of grace and mercy. I conclude today with our Holy Father's prayer for the year of mercy as we seek to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, you have taught us to be merciful like the Heavenly Father and have told us that whoever sees you sees him. Show us your face and we shall be saved. Your loving gaze freed Zacchaeus and Matthew from being enslaved by money. Freed the adulteress and Magdalene from seeking happiness only in created things. And made Peter weep after his betrayal. And assured paradise to the repentant thief. Let us hear as if addressed to each one of us the words you spoke to the Samaritan woman. If only you knew the gift of God. Send your spirit and consecrate every one of us with its anointing so that the jubilee of mercy may be a year of grace from the Lord and your church with renewed enthusiasm may bring good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to captives and the oppressed and restore sight to the blind. And we ask this of you, Lord Jesus, through the intercession of Mary, the mother of mercy, who lives and reigns with you in the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen.